Welcome back to the Mom and Mind podcast. I am your host, Dr. Kat. On our episode today, we are joined by Molly Vasa Bertolucci, and she is coming in on to share a bit about her story and how she is now helping other moms. Molly became a mom during the first few months of COVID, and she felt really blindsided by the birth and postpartum experience. Even as a therapist, um, there were some things that really surprised her as happens for a lot of us who don't really understand what can happen during this perinatal period. And, and one of the things that happened for her was postpartum anxiety, in part as a result of a NICU stay, because her daughter was having unexplained seizures. And this brought on a lot of anxiety, as I'm sure you can imagine that it would. And further on in her story, there was a missed OCD diagnosis. And she also talks about the struggle of deciding to have another child after a traumatic birth. Molly is a licensed clinical social worker in California and the founder of Poppy Therapy, where she helps new moms, postpartum women, and moms who want to find meaning and courage in the emotions, big decisions, transitions, and new experiences that come with motherhood. She's a mother of two and passionate about perinatal mental health. And when she's not doing therapy, Molly interviews moms about their first year of motherhood, for her podcast, Our First Year. Let's meet Molly. Welcome, Molly. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. Um, I really love talking with other therapists, um, especially other specialist therapists who, who have experienced uh, perinatal mental health stuff um, and know, kind of know both sides, understand both sides that you can you can speak to it from experience and, and also um, just really having the depth of knowledge of, of what's going on. Um, so yeah, I want to get into all of that, but I'd love for you to start wherever you'd like to start with your story. Yeah, sure. So the big picture of my story is that I felt really blindsided and isolated by my traumatic birth and the struggles that I had postpartum. I'm a therapist, you know, and I was well into my career as a mental health professional and trauma specialist when my first baby was born. And yet, and yet mm -hmm. it took a really long time, too long for me to understand what was going on with me and get support. Um, so it really has become my passion to increase awareness and support for perinatal mental health, especially around birth trauma and postpartum anxiety. Right. And there are a lot of us therapists in the specialty, I think that have that shared history of lived experience that leads to desire to support others through it. Mm -hmm. That's definitely my origin story um, mm -hmm. because having a baby changes you sure does. and experiencing birth trauma. <laughs> yeah, sure does. Mm -hmm. And then experiencing trauma, you know, postpartum anxiety, depression, OCD, any of that, it changes you too. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. I'll start at the beginning and break it down a little. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my husband and I had been married for about eight years when we decided to get pregnant. And it happened pretty quickly the first time. And then I had a miscarriage in the first trimester. Mm -hmm. And this was the first kind of blindside tackle because it never even crossed my mind that this could happen to me. Mm -hmm. I was not like an anxious person. I'm naturally pretty carefree, easygoing, optimistic person. And the miscarriage hurt me really badly. Mm -hmm. The grief was just really shocking mm -hmm. to me how emotionally heavy and painful that was. Right. Um, I got pregnant again about nine months later and I had a happy, healthy, uncomplicated pregnancy. And I think I convinced myself pretty easily that the miscarriage was a fluke thing. Mm -hmm. That was a bad thing that was going to happen to me, you know, and now I was uh, back on track. Yeah. Yeah. And then March, 2020 happened. Uh. And I remember being in a staff meeting that Friday that everything closed down and being like, this is great. Like I'm going to be home in my stretchy pants. I'm mm -hmm. six, seven months pregnant at this time. I'm going to put my feet up. This is so great. Like that's how unbothered mm -hmm. I was about mm -hmm. COVID. Mm -hmm. um, again, just not an anxious person. Of course, now we know that two weeks turned into almost two years <laughs> Yeah, and there was a lot to be anxious about with all of that. Um, my birth plan had always been for the baby to be born at a birth center. So unlike a lot of people that were pregnant at that time, um, my plans didn't change much. The birth center was still allowing partners. 
was still allowing one other support person, which was really important to me because my older sister was going to be there with us. Mm-hmm. Um, my labor was very long and it was traumatic. So I've done a lot of work around my birth experience with therapy and EMDR mm-hmm. and to give kind of a condensed version. I was in labor for 35 hours and pushed for almost five hours mm-hmm. and it was, it was brutal. I thought I was going to die oh, no. and my pain my concerns were dismissed kind of like, Oh, Oh. you know, first time mom going through, going through like normal, (laughs) normal pain of labor. Um, but I knew something was wrong and that was really, really difficult. That's interesting. I, if I can pause here for a second, because I think the, um, you know, the, um, the idea, uh, around, uh, birth center birth is that it's more in tune and more connected um, and, and I think, you know, pr- probably for the most part, it can be in it and it is, but I, I do think it's important because these kind of the, um, the things that we think, um, sometimes are the, the that are going to be supportive to us when they're not, um, are sometimes the most upsetting and the most disturbing. Um, so I, yes. I thank you for just kind of bringing that up that that your your concerns were dismissed um and I'm so sorry that they were yeah thank you yeah it's it is very interesting because there's it's kind of a seen as like a black and white or like Mm -hmm. you know hospital bad birth center good like hospital traumatic birth center supportive Mm -hmm. and there's so much that can happen in birth that can lead it to be traumatic right Mm -hmm. And, and um and that was part of what was difficult about my recovery was that it'll, it, it was hard to wrap my mind around that this was supposed to be such like a supportive environment. And I really trusted my body. I was an athlete. I was excited to see what my body could do. And so, you know, there was a, there's a lot there around why it was so traumatic too. Sure. So you, you knew something was, was wrong. At, at what point? I knew something was wrong. Um, it's really hard to say, but I knew that things were not progressing the way they should have. Mm -hmm. And every time I would say, I feel like I'm going to die. It was kind of just like, you can do this. You can do this. And I was thinking in my head, I cannot do this. Like I wasn't getting through. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And when my daughter was finally born, she was born, not breathing. Mm -hmm. Um, she had to be resuscitated and she didn't breathe for almost seven minutes. Um, and when she was resuscitated, we thought she was okay. You know, again, I thought that was super hard, but that's it. Like that's, that's going to be our hard thing. That was not expected. That rocked me, but okay. Like that's enough. (laughs) Now everything's going to be okay. Right. And spoiler alert, that wasn't the end of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we left the birth center after five hours. And now of course that makes my stomach like churn to say that there's no way we should have left and gone home after that kind of intense intervention for her breathing. Right. Um, There's no way we should have thought everything was okay, but we did. And um, I forgive myself for not knowing then. I'm glad you do. (laughs) The birth centers. Yeah, it was, it's been a journey for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, The birth center's policy was to have a nurse come by the house the next day to check on us. Mm -hmm. And while she was there, my daughter stopped breathing Uh, she turned blue and the nurse was was a little freaked out but she was like it could just be low blood sugar so just take her to the pediatrician and again like we should never have put that baby in a car seat and driven to a pediatrician but we didn't know how serious things were so got an appointment went to the pediatrician as soon as she walked in and took one look at our daughter, she ran out of the room, started yelling to call 911. And oh, she's my gosh. completely panicked, right? Like never a good thing. No, it doesn't feel good no, to see no, a doctor no. panic. And we had no, like, we're just sitting there shocked, you know, we have no yeah, idea what's course. going on. And she's asking us all these questions. And she tells us that our baby's having seizures. And neonatal seizures are really subtle. So it's like this small movement in the wrist and the ankle 
and it's like in sync on one side of the body. Mm. And now that I know that, I know she was having seizures all through the night, but it's just very small movements. And even, you know, when, when she was doing that at home, I thought she was like kind of just self-soothing, trying to like get comfy, but she was, she was having seizures. Um, um Like fre- frequently. Yeah. I was so it's sleep hard deprived. Know. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. hard to know. That. For sure. Yep. And we still don't know really what caused the seizures if it was the birth it was if it was something that was going on in utero and you know it's a big a big mystery so there's a lot still of um big gaps of knowledge of what was really happening with her um so at that point her and I were transferred to from the doctor's office to county hospital by ambulance and when we arrived in the ER she turned blue again And very quickly, there were like 10 doctors all around my newborn baby. It was just me. My husband had to drive separately. I intubated her. He pushed me out of the room. And I think that's when it really hit me. And I became like intensely afraid and sad. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just super, super scary. Yeah. So she was admitted to NICU and backing up a little bit, um, you know, the almost seven minutes of no breathing when she's born three to five minutes of oxygen deprivation can cause serious brain damage for newborns. So the first thing we found out besides the fact that she was having seizures pretty and having them pretty frequently was that she didn't have any brain damage. And apparently this is pretty miraculous. Mm -hmm. And from then on, we were really lucky in that we only really got good news. She did really well in the NICU on seizure medication, but they just didn't know what was causing the seizures. Right. Other NICU parents will likely relate to this. It was a lot of like counting down of like, okay, once she's off the ventilator for this long, once she's breathing room air for this long, like all this counting down of when she can come home, once the medication is controlling the seizures for this long, it's just a long waiting game. And this was 2020. So because of COVID restrictions, my husband and I were only able to be at bedside once one at a time. So when we weren't with her, we had to be in the general waiting room and it was really tough. Um, the thing that really saved me during that, that time was having family to support us. My parents, Mm -hmm. my sister, my in-laws every night, they brought us food and they brought us dinner when we came home from the hospital and they'd either sit with us and just let us, you know, just download everything we'd learned that day because you take in so much information right and you're just going through every scenario so they just they would sit and listen or they would just leave and let us rest and it was just so so incredibly helpful yeah yeah so there's you know there's a lot of anxiety that goes (laughs) with being in the NICU it's it's a stressful environment Mm -hmm. and then there's a lot of anxiety when you get to come home too So she'd been surrounded by medical professionals, you know, basically her entire life. She was on medication and I had seen her stop breathing, you know, so I was afraid to take her home. And then all of a sudden you're on your own. How, how long um, was her NICU stay? So she was only there for about a week and a half. Mm -hmm. And then she she was was stabilized enough to be able to. Mm -hmm. She was still, she's what, like barely two weeks old. Yeah. Yeah. She went in on day one. So she was less than two weeks old. Um, and you know, you get, you get kind of used to being able to see the monitors Mm -hmm. (laughs) and just seeing like, Oh, she's breathing. Like I can see that she's breathing and I can, I can tell from this visual information that she's okay. Mm -hmm. And then that's gone, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's definitely fear there. Um, and a lot, a lot of relief and excitement and just joy to be able to be home with her and Mm -hmm. just get to be her mom and get Mm -hmm. to hold her Mm -hmm. and feed her and change her, like all these things you don't get to do in the NICU. And so I was just thrilled. And I remember she would cry at night and my first thought would be like, yes, I get to go be with her. Like it was a really happy time. I would say the first month or month and a half that she was home. Mm-hmm. So I thought we were in the clear. 
you know, we had been mm -hmm. in our own little bubble of trauma. We just weren't connected with the outside world or what was happening at all. It just wasn't on our radar. Um, we were just kind of tunnel visioned with our own situation. And then once we got home, there was a lot of space and quiet to kind of start processing what had happened. Mm -hmm. And just as that honeymoonish feeling of being home was starting to fade out a little bit, the world outside just really fell apart. Mm -hmm. um, California was on fire that summer. Oh yeah, <laughs> I remember. I, remember. I do remember. It was terrifying. It was, yeah, it was, it felt like the end of the world. For like, sure. And we lived near the San Gabriel Mountains then and you couldn't go outside. Like mm -hmm. We were running air purifiers in every room. Our home smelled like smoke. You couldn't escape it. Mm -hmm. um, it was really intense. And George Floyd was murdered. And because of the protests and COVID, LA County had implemented like mandatory curfews. Mm -hmm. And the COVID numbers were really scary. Like mm -hmm. people we knew were starting to get sick and die. It just, mm -hmm. it really felt like the end of the world. Yeah. And I started to feel really scared and really isolated. Everyone was isolated. And that's just, it's not a good place to be postpartum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, this is where I felt blindsided. Like we had made it. We'd already endured the trauma. We'd been through the hard part. She was okay. And I didn't know then what I know now that birth trauma and a NICU stay increases the rates of perinatal mood and anxiety disorders and PTSD. Mm -hmm. All I knew then was that I worried a lot about her health. And I felt like if I didn't check on her all the time, she would stop breathing and die. And that, that didn't seem that far fetched, right? Because one, she'd stopped breathing before mm -hmm. <laughs> and two, the air was really bad. Right. And so I think it started there, just this really common fear that moms have that their baby mm -hmm. will stop breathing in the night. Mm -hmm. And then it was a bit of a slippery slope because I could rationalize a lot of my fears. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. It makes it the really difficult to like when, when fear and like recent reality become fused in, in that way, it's sure. Even as a therapist, like you could use all your skills or <laughs> all the, all the stuff. Um, but there's a way in which even though you might be able to, and I don't know if this was your experience, but even if you might be able to recognize a fear is a fear or a thought as an irrational thought. You're so lit up emotionally. Um, and there's nothing like that vulnerability of um, fearing for your child. Mm, but yeah, just nothing so like raw. Mm -hmm. You're so afraid and exposed, like just so vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And the fear was the main thing. I think mm -hmm. just being in constant fear that something bad was going to happen and yeah. bad things were happening. Right. And then so something bad happened to us. My beloved dog died. And this was like the floodgates opening, just mm -hmm. the combination of the health anxiety and the trauma. And then just being in such a vulnerable state of grief. Yeah. It supercharged my anxiety and it yeah. It really catapulted me into OCD. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the best way I can describe my experience with OCD is that I felt every single second that went by, I was just consumed by fear and doubt. Mm -hmm. I couldn't sleep. It got to where I couldn't drive with my baby in the car. Yeah. I would become like convinced that I hadn't shut her door. Mm -hmm. And then I would have really vivid images of her car seat falling out of the car. Mm. So I'd pull over like, multiple times on a short drive to just go around and check that the door was shut. And then, you know, on the way back, I, I would just get convinced that it wasn't shut well enough. Or I didn't check well enough. And I yeah. couldn't help it. I could just never feel sure. Right. And it was really tough because my compulsions were really sneaky. Um, and what I mean is it wasn't really visible um, it was a lot of mental compulsions and rumination. And so I was just putting myself through this mental and emotional torture just constantly. And I remember being in bed, just like so, so tired, crying, trying to resist thinking about like these horrible scenarios and just being exhausted. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And there was also a lot of health anxiety and uncertainty because we just didn't know what was going on with her seizures. Um, they were controlled by medication, but that medication was not a long-term solution because it was really a sedative. Mm. And so we were very slowly weaning her off this medication, not knowing how that would all play out. Right. And then not knowing what the effect of the seizures or even that kind of sedation, like what that would do to her development. Right. And so it just was more and more fuel for like the mental and emotional chaos that was going on in my head. Yeah. I mean, there's, it, there's no, um, there's no area of your life that doesn't have a big question mark on it. I mean, uh, outside of like, you know, the, the connection or stability in your relationship, um, mm-hmm. or relationships, like people you can count on is what I mean. But even mm-hmm. with COVID people you can count on, can't be there for you in the way that you're used to them being there for you. Um, so mm-hmm. it's, it's such a huge amount of upheaval. Yes. That is such a good word for it. Like that, that's what it felt like. Like there was no stable ground. Everything felt very shifty and uncertain for yeah. sure. Yeah. And during all of this, I had a really hard time telling the difference between what was being a first time mom, Mm. adjusting to motherhood and what were mental health symptoms. Mm -hmm. I had a really hard time describing my symptoms and what was going on in my brain. Like I knew something wasn't right, Mm. but there was a lot of dismissal or downplaying of my experience. Things like, oh, welcome to motherhood. Or like when you're a mom, you worry, like your heart lives outside your body. You just, COVID heightened everyone's anxiety. So, you know, no one thought it was strange. I wasn't taking her out and about. So all of that just kind of compounded it. And I remember being really like flummox, just being like, how can all these moms survive this? Like, how is everyone just going through life, feeling like this all the time? Mm -hmm. Like, if this is motherhood, like, I am not cut out for this. And it was just really hard for me. I didn't know that what was happening in my head was not the norm, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I was a therapist, but I just couldn't clock the symptoms as symptoms. I couldn't see them from where I was in the midst of them. Yep. So... I suffered for a long time and I remember being at my sister's once she has four kids and I just was kind of talking to her like casually mentioned this really graphic intrusive thought I'd had about something happening to my baby and you know these things were happening in my head all the time yeah but she looked at me with this face of like horror and concern and she said something like that sounds so scary I'm really sorry and that's when I realized like oh, I was right. This isn't normal. Like this isn't just mm-hmm. first time mom stuff. Mm-hmm. Like I need to get some help. Um, so up until that point, uh, did, did anybody know that something was going on for you or, um, yeah, there was, there was no, no. inkling anywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Isn't that it just amazing? went really under the radar. It's fascinating to me and so sad how well we can just continue to function while you feel like probably the worst you've ever felt. Oh yeah. And just, yeah, just not a moment of like rest. Right. It just constant. Yeah. And still, yeah, still functioning, still caring for an infant. Mm -hmm. And even after, you know, even after I got help and support and I was stabilized, trying to describe what I was going through to people, they'd be like, I had no idea. And it, yeah, it, mm-hmm. it's, it's wild. Yeah. So, so your mm-hmm. sister didn't know. Um, and, and in some ways you're just starting to really realize it at that point. How, yeah. how far out um, was that? So I think that was when she was about six months old. Mm-hmm. Long um, and initially I began with just talk therapy And that was just really not helpful for me with the OCD symptoms at all. Mm -hmm. It just kind of fueled the rumination, the mental, like I was just searching for clarity so I could talk for hours and hours and go around and around Mm -hmm. trying to find some certainty and reassurance. Like it was, it was exhausting. Mm -hmm. Um, So an SSRI helped really turn down the volume 
right. on that and getting give me some margins and like a vantage point to see everything a little bit clearer and get on top of that um and then EMDR helped me process the birth experience and again I was so isolated just the combination of the pandemic and my unique birth and postpartum experience with the seizures and the NICU stay I I tried to go to some like zoom new mom circles new parent circles and the topics like the things that other new parents were going through were just not what I was going through And there would be like well-meaning comments that left me just feeling really alone. And I eventually found Hand to Hold. It's an organization that supports NICU parents. Mm -hmm. They had Zoom support groups. And attending that group was a huge turning point for me. I felt, I think for the first time that I wasn't alone in some of my experiences. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, Right. Mm -hmm. And so... I mean, I think, I I don't know if you got these types of questions, but the kind of how did you not know something was going on? I I think if you've been through something like this, then you for sure know how you don't know. Um, Because it's in, in part like when you're in survival mode, you're not always like meta thinking about like, hmm, how come I'm choosing to interact with people this way or what like it's not you don't have access to that it's really just fundamental like basic get through the day yes yeah totally and when things were really tough like all that time I didn't know I was dealing with OCD Mm -hmm. that's not the diagnosis I was giving and so like the line between generalized anxiety disorder and OCD is a bit gray and to a certain extent, it doesn't always matter. But for me, knowing that I was dealing with OCD helped me make sense of what was happening with me. Mm -hmm. Like I could look at the way my brain was functioning and understand why it was so incredibly uncomfortable for me to sit with like any uncertainty and how that was driving my behavior. Yeah. And the avoidance, you know, reassurance seeking all the like compulsions that were taking over my life. I think that getting a diagnosis of OCD sooner and being able to understand my experience in light of that would have relieved so much of my suffering. Mm-hmm. Like the PTSD, right. the health anxiety, yeah. I could wrap my mind around that because it made sense to me in light of the birth trauma and the NICU stay, right? Like anyone would say like, oh, that was scary. That was traumatic. But the OCD is what really blindsided me. Like, okay, everyone's okay. Like we're home, we're safe. But like I did not feel safe. Mm -hmm. And so understanding more about OCD helped me a lot. Um, So at at what point did that become more clear or did, did somebody help you figure that part out? Yeah, I had a therapist I was working with for the PTSD. And at some point she, she was like, just, I think, I don't remember what it was exactly, but something clicked for her and she was like, okay, this isn't, this isn't helpful for you. We need to add in this, a supportive medication. And like a lot of, I think new moms, I was hesitant Mm -hmm. about medication because I didn't know, you know, is it safe to breastfeed with this? And even when you do know that Mm -hmm. sometimes you think like, I don't want to do that or I shouldn't need medication, right? There's tons of stigma and shame around medication. And so it took, it took me a while to get there and, and I'm, I'm, it was life-changing. It was really life-changing to get the medication and then to get the diagnosis of OCD Mm -hmm. and to start working, Mm -hmm. working on the avoidance and work on not engaging with the compulsions and the rumination. Mm-hmm. Um, real quick, I, I think for parents out there who are listening, who are, you know, who aren't as familiar with uh, OCD and diagnosis, um, I wonder if it'd be helpful to um, say a little bit about like what, what the obsession was and what the compulsion was so that maybe if somebody out there is experiencing it, they would be able to recognize that too. Yeah. Yeah. So 
like I said, it was really sneaky. So for example, a thought would come into my head of, of me accidentally hurting my baby somehow. And then I would make myself picture that to see how upset I would be and then question if I was upset enough. So like, would I care if she got hurt? And of course I would, I was making myself sick over it. Yeah. And that's what OCD does. It mm -hmm. goes after what you love. Mm -hmm. So I was just putting myself through this mental and emotional torture of just like picturing this, these things over and over and making myself picture it to just be sure that I would be upset. Mm -hmm. And it was, yeah, exhausting and so confusing and just, just like heart wrenching, right? You're yeah. no one wants to have these like horrible visions of things bad happening to their, their child. But that's what I would just feel like I had to do mm -hmm. to make sure that, um, that I loved her, that she was safe, like just yep. over and over again. Right. So nobody knows this is happening. This is so right. internal. Um, to your point, it's a mental compulsion. It's not like mm, something that you might be able to see a little more like classic OCD type of symptoms. Like if somebody's hands are, are red from washing them all the time. Um, like yep. that stuff you can see, this is internal and it's, um, uh, you know, a special kind of torture, if you will. Um, and I, I think w one of the things you said that's super, super important is that uh, just to highlight is that you do all of the time that this is happening, you don't want any of that to be happening to your daughter. Right. You're, right. you're making Opposite. sure that it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's not, I mean, and you're horrified by having to go through this process. Um, and I just, if that's one of the things like that people who haven't experienced this don't really get, um, so think, thanks for highlighting that. Um, so the, the, the people up there who are experiencing it, who are having such an internal experience really wouldn't know how to pick up on it. Yeah. And it is so torturous because then you're thinking why am I having these thoughts right mm -hmm. and we know that it's because this, the part of your brain that's protective is light is just lit up mm -hmm. right like you're you're wanting to do everything you can to protect this baby and it's your brain going into overdrive right yep. yeah but it feels really scary when you're you're going through it and really yeah really horrible it is. So you, you, you were saying that the, the medication plus the therapy started to get, come out of this a bit. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> and then that led me into like thinking about doing it all again. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the decision to have a, another child is any decision to have a child is incredibly personal and complicated. And with birth trauma and health concerns for baby and mental health concerns for mom that all certainly adds to the decision. Mm. So for us, once I had my feet under me, I was in recovery pretty quickly. We started thinking about another child because we knew we wanted to, and we wanted them close in age. We didn't know, and we still don't know what caused my first daughter's seizures. So, um, we did what genetic testing we could both for her and for us. And ultimately just all we could do is take that information and use it in our decision-making. Um, we didn't get really clear answers. There was no, nothing that came back that felt like it added clarity. It was just, you know, seemed like a fluke thing. Um, she's, she's doing great by the way. She's off all medications. She's not no longer followed by a neurologist. She's, mm -hmm. um, pretty, pretty well within the developmental, um, like window. She said she's done really well. Um, but by the, you know, by this time we didn't know all that. So it was, it was still pretty unknown. Um, but we decided to, to have another child. And I think there can be a temptation to have like a do-over of a negative birth experience or yep. postpartum experience. And I think that was present for me a little bit. Um, my second birth ended up being really healing in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. 
But a lot of that does have to do with the therapeutic support, both processing the first birth and preparing for the second. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to have another baby after birth trauma to heal. You don't have to have another baby after postpartum anxiety or anything to heal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I did put in place with my second pregnancy a lot of supports for postpartum that just weren't on my radar with the first. I was on medication. I had a therapist, just the practical help mm. that I didn't know I needed and also wasn't available because of COVID. Mm -hmm. And then also being really intentional about being part of a community of other moms. I just, I knew so much more, you know, so I wasn't going to be blindsided. Mm -hmm. And you've written, Dr. Kat, you shouldn't have to learn about perinatal mental health the hard way. Mm -hmm. And that so resonates with me. I think a lot of us in this field, we did learn the hard way. Mm -hmm. And we know now that it doesn't have to be that way. Right. No, and no. We know how much support there is. Yeah. Um, and there really is, but it's, there's, there's still too large a gap between, um, you know, people, people finding out the hard way and then figuring out that there's help available. I mean, the, the gap is closing for, for sure. Um, and little by little. Little by little, it's inching towards that. So at, at what point for you did you decide to specialize in perinatal mental health? I think pretty quickly, once I realized what was going on with me, I was like, everyone needs to know about this. Like, mm -hmm. I, I can't believe I didn't know about this. Right. And it kind of became my whole personality pretty quickly of like, <laughs> let's talk about birth uh -huh. trauma. Let's uh -huh. talk about postpartum mental health. Like, uh -huh. um, <laughs> it's like this whole new world opened up for me. And I had specialized in trauma before my kids were born. And so it felt kind of like a natural um, path of being able to kind of take all of that expertise and experience and then really want to focus on birth trauma. So I, I focus mostly on birth trauma and postpartum anxiety with the moms I work with mm -hmm. and also with just how helpful EMDR was for me um, and having my own personal experience with it that mm -hmm. led me down that path as well. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was like, okay, this, this was really the, the impetus of this is what I want to do. This is, these are, I could talk about this all day. You know, right. this is what I, what I really care about. Yeah. And you know how huge the need is speaking to those gaps. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's, there's no shortage of people who um, need, need your help, need our help, need a specialist. Mm -hmm. And there, there are still there's a lot of room for more specialists to come, <laughs> to come into this field. Um, we just need more people doing this work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you think about the fact that 85% of women become mothers, and then you think about the stats of perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, there's just so many people that are suffering or, or do need that kind of support. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's huge. Massive. Um, and you've started to do some other fun stuff. Yes. Yeah. I have recently started a, a podcast, which is like completely outside of my comfort zone. <laughs> and <laughs> funny being on a podcast, but it has <laughs> been so much fun, right? Mm -hmm. It's so much mm -hmm. fun, right? It is. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my podcast is called Our First Year and it's interviewing new moms or interviewing moms about their first year of motherhood. Mm -hmm. And this came again from my experience of, you know, the first year wanting to ask so many questions about how everyone else was doing this. Yeah. Just like I devoured birth stories when I was pregnant. Cause I wanted to know, you know, what are all the possible outcomes and what, what's it like for everyone else? Mm -hmm. And I just didn't find anything like that for, for parenthood. And so that's, mm -hmm. that's the, origin story of our first year and it's it's quickly become you know one of my favorite things to do is to talk to moms about their first year of motherhood and mm -hmm. learn about their families yeah it's amazing to hear people's experiences because they're they can be so unique and different 
um, at the same time that there are so many similarities, um, but just like the thread that, that weaves um, a lot of people together, even if it looks slightly different um, from yeah, person absolutely. to person, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, and, and such a great um, perspective uh, to give, to be able to share with other people that it doesn't have to look one way. And it often yeah, doesn't. There's no right way. Yeah, yeah totally. No one there right are, way. Right. To be. There are a lot more right ways than there are like, quote unquote, wrong ways. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, um, so yeah, great. That's awesome. And understanding, you know, that you as a, as a therapist, similar, I have a similar story, didn't know what was going on. Um, but from all that you've learned and all that you've experienced, what, what's your like top takeaways for, for parents who are going through this? Yeah. I just want parents to know that there's help. If things feel hard, you don't need to fit into a diagnosis or you don't need to know what's going on with you to get help and to benefit from help. So if you're not feeling like yourself, reach out, you know, I know now, of course, as a therapist, just how much support there is for parents. Um, but it's, it's out there. There's a whole world of support out there for you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story and your experience. And, um, I just know that there are, are people out there who will hear themselves in your story and, and get the help that they need. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Kat, for having me. If you'd like to get connected with Molly, please find her on Instagram at Poppy Therapy or her website, poppytherapy.com. And for those of you who are suffering or know somebody who could be suffering, for sure share episodes like this so that people out there can know that they are not alone. It is hard to measure how important it is for people who are feeling alone and are feeling lonely and confused by their experience to know how much your story or someone like Molly's story impacts people, impacts their ability to know that they can get through this. And I have also created several courses online for people who are suffering, who can't quite get to a therapist yet, or who aren't even sure that they need or want to go to a therapist yet. The courses I've created are bite-sized. They're very easy to look through or listen to, and it's on demand and you can do them at your own pace. So again, if you or anybody that you know is struggling in this postpartum period with the adjustment to parenthood, want to understand why you feel the way that you feel, and more importantly, have tools and tricks to get through, then please go to wellmindperinatal.com to my courses section and find out for yourself how they can be beneficial to you. Thank you so much for being with us. Until next time.